because we are broadcasting also out of Asia, um, generally speaking, how does glaucoma affect Asian populations? One of the things that uh, is that we tend to see in, in some of these populations a little more of what's called primary angle closure glaucoma. And this is believed to be related to just the the physiology, the physical structure of the eye and the surrounding tissues and so forth. And there are different treatments. I mean, again, laser can be used uh, potentially for some types of angle closure glaucoma. Um, so that does, there is a little higher prevalence of that. Um, and the other thing is in, in Japan, I'm told there's a, also a higher uh, prevalence of so-called normal tension glaucoma. And uh, that's a little bit of a misnomer because there is, mm -hmm. there is no such thing as normal tension glaucoma, but but typically, you know, average pressures are, are maybe whatever, 15 to 18 millimeters or something like that is kind of the average. But just because you're outside the average, you know, it's like saying, what's the average height? You know, there isn't a, there isn't a magic height that you have to be to be healthy, and there isn't a magic pressure that you have to have to not get glaucoma. But uh, nonetheless, the because of this feeling that elevated pressure is is causative and that we want to lower pressure people tend to look at pressure the most mm. and uh, but the reality is each person each individual has a pressure that's kind of right for them and if a person's glaucoma is getting worse at any pressure the solution is really to lower the pressure that's that's really all we can do and in fact, Glaucoma Research Foundation funded one of the first controlled clinical trials that actually established that treating patients with, quote, normal tension or normal pressures did help to preserve vision. That's been established long ago. It's just sometimes harder to detect. It's easy if you get your eye pressure measured and your pressure is high. OK, you might have glaucoma. Go and get checked. Because, again, pressure is only one of a half a dozen things that you look at. You have to look at the optic nerve. You have to look at the thickness of the retinal nerve fiber layers. You, you examine the drainage areas. So um, you look at the thickness of the cornea. Um, you know, there's a whole group of measurements um, that you do before you diagnose glaucoma. Pressure is just one of them. That's fascinating. So really, 21 millimeters of mercury is uh, not always the threshold after all. And it hasn't been for years. So th this has been a huge uh, subject of ongoing debate. It's just a number that somebody pulled out of the air and said, if it's over 21, you have glaucoma, and if it's under 21, you don't. Absolutely not true. 100% not true. Fascinating. Fascinating. And here it is. I've been in the field in journalism and ophthalmology for so many years, and that's what sticks in my mind. So, uh, yeah. so I'm glad well, to you and, today. You and millions of others. <laughs> 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 and and it and it's a shame because if somebody comes in and their pressures are 15 and you send them away and say they're fine and they actually have glaucoma and not only that it's getting worse you've done a huge disservice so pressure alone is absolutely not diagnostic it's one of the risk factors for glaucoma uh moving on to africa um, since WOC was set to take place in Africa, and because Africa is such a high prevalence of glaucoma, can you provide any insight into the situation there? Oh, Matt, I wish I could. Um, I know that uh, Western Africa has the highest prevalence of glaucoma in the world, and I know there's effort to, to be able to, to treat, to diagnose and treat these people in Africa. And there are groups um, like Orbis and others, uh, other nonprofit organizations uh, that do missions there to try to train glaucoma specialists or train ophthalmologists. But I can't tell you a lot about specifically what is going on in Africa. I'm just not that knowledgeable. It definitely needs attention. Um, and the, one of the things here is the demographics because as life expectancies increase, so that's the good news in Africa, is people are living longer. The life expectancy, I think, used to be 45 years. Well, glaucoma is an age-related disease. So the good news is people are living longer, and that means more of them will be getting glaucoma. And that's why we see 
you know, globally, a, a real increase in, in glaucoma from, you know, I think it's estimated maybe 80 million people in, around the world today have glaucoma. And uh, but projections are for this to go up significantly in the next decade. And Africa is certainly an area that deserves attention. So that's interesting because um, ethnically, Africans may be predisposed to glaucoma. And, and because of this life expectancy uh, going up, now that that could be on the rise even. Um, so for, for populations like that, uh, especially in areas where, you know, let's say, um, you know, don't have access to the latest uh, gold standards, what are the treatments that are likely to be most available? Are they drops? Well, I think today is eye drops. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, in my opinion, I, th I really think it should be laser. Um, and again, it's because of the issues. Even think of drop storage. You know, do, do people have refrigeration? I mean, if they don't have running water, for example, are they going to have, do they have electricity? Do they have refrigeration? Um, eye drops, should, both in the distribution and in the use, should be stored in a cool environment. Um, and uh, and the whole compliance issue, I think, is, is a factor. And the diagnosis. I mean, remember, glaucoma is basically has, has no symptoms. Mm -hmm. So um, so here you have people that are susceptible to a disease or no symptoms. You have a, a low ratio of doctors to patients. Um, so there's a, a lot of things going on there that I think need to be addressed. You know, and I think eye drops are certainly, I'm sure today, the most available treatment. The question is, are they being used? And again, if, if you did use uh, SLT, and again, I'm not trying to promote SLT, uh, but I, uh, but I guess in a way I am. <laughs> mm -hmm. but I do see it as a, as an option for for people where you may only get to see them once every every few years, even. Now, again, the 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 study in the UK showed. I think, again, don't hold me to this. I think it was like 73. I want to say 73 percent were still controlled at three years on that study. Um, so one of the keys with SLT is patients still need to be followed, but maybe not every six months. Maybe it can be annually. Um, right. Uh, yeah. So. Well, it's interesting because perhaps in Africa, uh, certainly in India, for example, we see um, efforts toward eye camps to get out to remote parts. Yeah. And so perhaps with eff efforts like telemedicine, uh, remote populations could be diagnosed and then brought into a more centralized hospital system where laser could be could be performed. Is that sort of a system that you could foresee working in, in a place like Africa? I think definitely. And, and there are examples of that already. I mean, even in Canada, um, where you have uh, northern Canada, where you have remote areas um, and there are no ophthalmologists, uh, they use telemedicine and um, people who have glaucoma can go to a local clinic. Uh, they can take pictures. Uh, they can take pressure measurements. They can send that to the ophthalmologist who may be hundreds of miles away and he can review that and say, yeah, they better come in or no, they're fine. Uh, look at them again in six months. So absolutely. Uh, telemedicine is absolutely here to stay. I mean, I think the, the COVID crisis has helped to accelerate the acceptance and understanding and it's a huge opportunity for both diagnostics and for, uh, and, and especially for some a disease like glaucoma, where so much of it, you know, eye pressures can be done remote, photographs can be made remotely. And so it's, it's a great opportunity. Hope you'll join us for uh, Glaucoma 360, uh, January 29th. It's our 10th anniversary. And we're going to make it a global meeting. And we're really excited about it because we'll be able to have participants from around the world, companies from around the world. So it's going to be an amazing meeting. So put it on your calendar, January 29th. Well, you've blown my mind here today, Tom. Uh, thanks so much for joining us in our, in our brand new studio, uh, broadcasting from Vietnam to Africa to the U.S., obviously. And... We look forward to, to you joining us again sometime.